Welcome everyone to uh, Anne's webinar on um, orchids. Uh, we have some terrific guests today. We have uh, Laurie Hack, from, uh, who is the executive director of uh, Orchid. Laurie, are you with us? Yes, thank you. And uh, it's coming, leaning in through the you know, miracles of modern science from uh, Washington. Is that where you are at the moment? Yes. Is that where Orchid is, uh, is based? Um, Orchid is, uh, well, I'm based here. We're based all over the place. We have offices all over. Oh, okay. That's good. And uh, I assume it's, uh, it's a beautiful morning here in Canberra where evening time in Washington, is that right? Have you had yeah. your hot chocolate and snuggling you into bed or? Yeah, quite? no, it's spring here, so it's not quite that cold, but yes. <laughs> good. All right. And uh, we also have uh, Amir Ariani, who's a project manager and uh, Systems Analyst uh, at ANS. We'll talk uh, a little bit later about the um, ANS Orchid uh, Interoperability Project. Um, first of all, just to a uh, little context, ANS, we have a series of webinars uh, about data management, about uh, licensing of data. Um, we have a particular interest in identifying researchers and um, that's because uh, you know what part of Anne's mission is to um, have the research data, the outputs of research projects um, considered in some way, you know, uh, in a metaphorical way, uh, similar to the other outputs of um, research. So, like a publication of uh, of a research project, and that's been a very strong. Um, push within the ANS project is you know, from a systems point of view, from a policy point of view, from a um, procedure point of view, from a, a, from a cultural point of view, to have the outputs, the data outputs of research you know, promoted up there as, as one of the you know, first class outputs of research. Um, and in doing that, you, know, you come into the whole web of information about research. In particular, we start from the data sets, but that's obviously linked to the people and the organizations that create those data sets, the research projects that uh, were the genesis of that you know, data that, that was created, the, um, some of the fundamental concepts that are used within each data set so that you can link a data set to another one because it's I don't know, it shares a concept of salinity or an observation about you know, temperature or something like that. Um, there are other shared concepts that, that link data sets together, like you know, the location of the observation or, or a time. All those key things uh, help us to connect the, you know, data sets to other data sets, connect uh, data to other parts of research, and give us both uh, a richer discovery of data, but also a, a, a richer use of data, better analysis and better integration. Um, now, all those things uh, you know, make for a very rich information experience. And uh, the people in that, that mix of, of, of um, let's call them elements of the research uh, environment, you know, the data, the people, the, the projects, um, of, of all those, the people are probably one of the richest uh, pivot points, if you like, in a, in, a, in a global information system about data and about research. Because the, um, in particular, uh, with the rise of data citation, people wanting, you know, uh, and organizations looking for acknowledgement about data, uh, the people really are a, a key pivot point. That, uh, they create the data, they take part in these research grants, and and projects and and linking the data with the people uh, for acknowledgement is is one of the key, another key um, plank of the ANS project. Um, in doing that, we get information about data from universities, from publishers, from grant funding bodies, from libraries, and that information about the people and the linkage between the people and their data can come in little islands. So we get a little glimpse of what somebody's done from a university where they worked. We can get a glimpse of what they're doing from a publisher where they've published. We can get a glimpse of what they're doing from a national library of, a, of one of the countries where they've worked. But trying to pull all that information together about the, the researcher and their data from these diverse sources of information has is uh, both a huge opportunity in the, in the 
internet and information science, but also a challenge in that you know we get uh, a glimpse of what Amir Ariani is doing from his employer, from his publisher, from the library, and and how do you pull together all that information about Amir into a, a real profile of of his uh, data, for example, and uh, and his research profile. Uh, so you know, as has been you know with our um, Research Data Australia portal, which is you know a window onto Australian data and the Australian Data Commons, uh, we have come up against this requirement to pull together information about people and data sets from diverse sources. Uh, we've been working for a number of years with local, you know, with the National Library in Australia around um, identifying researchers. And uh, with the emergence of ORCID last year, we were uh, absolutely thrilled to, you know, be involved with the ORCID project because that's um, another way of bringing together information about researchers, linking the researchers with their research output. Now, as we were saying, the research output of data is, a, is a, one of the core um, planks of the uh, ANS project. So with this, um, um, the emergence of ORCID is a really very exciting uh, opportunity uh, we see from the ANS project to, to get involved and um, to enable this, that, that linkage, uh, which really, so we see it really not that, well, we see in the words of, you know, Teddy Kennedy, you know, what can uh, we do for ORCID, but really what, what can we do for, uh, do for us as well, you know, it really is a, a key um, solution to a, you know, to a, a problem which we've been uh, chipping away at for quite some time. So we've invited uh, Laurie here today to um, give an overview of the ORCID um, um, uh, initiative uh, and is supporting uh, with um, information webinars, the webinar that you're at. We also have some uh, technical integration, which we'll hear about a little bit later. So uh, Laurie is the executive director of ORCID. Uh, ORCID, we'll hear about it a little bit uh, in, in more detail from Laurie herself. Laurie's had a, a very interesting career in research and research management and in the scholarly, scholarly societies uh, related with research. So she uh, has a PhD in neuroscience and has worked as um, a researcher with the National Institutes of Health in the uh, United States. She's worked with the uh, National Academies as well, which is a scholarly society uh, in the States. Uh, she's worked in research management systems in the in the commercial world um, with uh, Discovery Logic, uh, which then became part of uh, Thomson Reuters. So these are the you know research management systems that are used uh, by research organisations. And now she's uh, with Orchid with all that terrific experience of all those different aspects of um, of research. So Laurie, do you have some uh, slides for us about the Orchid? Initiative, is that right? Can we? Yes, I do. So you can switch it over to me and I'll see if I can't set this up so everyone can see this. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So here is you. All right, so that should be right. So it's only the 22nd here, but <laughs> I guess you're used to being <laughs> ahead. <laughs> so um, what, I, what I wanted to do today uh, from my fabulous perch in springtime Washington, D.C., is tell you a bit about where we are with ORCID. Um, and for those people who um, aren't aware of what ORCID is, um, go a little bit through the benefits of ORCID and also kind of what kind of an organization we are. Um, I know that there's a little uh, question answer screen here, so we'll be looking at those. Um, and if folks have questions directly about the slides, um, we'll try to field those right after the presentation. Otherwise, I know that Adrian's made time for Q&A at the end of the session. So um, I'll launch yeah, That's a in. good point, uh, Laurie. We might, um, the, there's a little module, if you haven't attended one of these webinars before, there's a little module there that says uh, questions or chat, is that right? And uh, if you've got a question, just type it in. And when uh, we come to the end of this presentation, we'll either um, pass directly to you if you have a microphone, or we'll just read out the question and um, go to discussion on that. So, Laurie. All right. Well, thank you so much. So um, there's a number of questions that folks might have. Um, and I put a few of them up on this slide here. 
Um, why do I have to manually enter data? What happens to this data if I should happen to move? Are these two names referring to the same person? Maybe a question that both an individual researcher, but also somebody in management or administration may also have um, when looking at the data they have for their university data set, repository, whatever. Um, from a university perspective, they might want to know how can we know what our researchers have produced. This is really close to what um, Adrian was talking about, was is how do we connect research to outputs, in particular for ANS, uh, with data sets. How do we keep our repository up to date is another big one. Researchers are sick and tired of spending so much time doing reporting. Is there a way that this reporting process and repository deposition can be streamlined? Um, how can we accurately benchmark research strengths and impact? Um, Australia is far and away ahead of most other places on Earth when it comes to benchmarking research and really trying to track research outputs. Um, but there's still issues with trying to identify linkages between people, um, their activities, their organizations, and their, um, their other <laughs> research outputs. Um, and finally, um, a funder may be asking, as well as um, a university, how can we follow people who have participated in our program? So this is career tracking. Um, are people, um, are these trainees members of our organizations? Might be something that a professional association might ask, for example. The common thing in all of these questions uh, comes down to um, name ambiguity um, and really providing a way to identify individuals in, in, in between and among systems. So what the mission of ORCID is is centered exactly on that. Um, we are working on um, a system to discreetly identify um, people participating in research that uh, crosses disciplines, organizations, and countries. Without such a service, the research community lacks the ability to accurately and easily identify and link researchers and scholars with their professional activities. So what is ORCID? Um, we're international, we're interdisciplinary, we're an open organization and not-for-profit. Uh, we're also community-driven. Uh, we listen very closely to what the community is looking for um, to solve name ambiguity issues, um, and we do implement community suggestions. We collaborate extensively with researchers and organizations across the research community, with universities, with funders, um, with um, uh, with vendors, with publishers, et cetera, and I'll go into that a little bit more because we've been working it so far. Um, we have a two-part core mission. The first part is to provide an open registry of persistent and unique identifiers for researchers and scholars. That's the first piece. But we also know that just providing that registry is not enough. Um, so we also work very closely with the research community to ensure that these identifiers are embedded in key research workflows. And I'll talk a bit about which workflows they are, but um, workflows that capture, for example, manuscript submissions, grant applications, data set depositions, and make sure that this ORCID identifier, this personal identifier, becomes embedded in that document as a piece of the metadata. So it's those two pieces, the identifier itself and the linking and vetting mechanism. That is what ORCID does. All right, so what is the ORCID identifier? I put this slide near the beginning. Does people, what is it? What are you talking about? I want to see what one looks like. Um, so this is an example of an ORCID identifier. It's expressed as a URI. So the identifier is this entire expression from the HTTP at the beginning to the dash 0097 at the end. It's a 16-digit number, expresses a URL, uh, URI, and it's also compatible with an ISO standard um, that's been published by ISNI. And if anyone's been following the blogosphere, um, ISNI and ORCID, ORCID just today announced um, our commitment to interoperability between our systems. Um, this is really going to help um, individuals in the research space uh, bring a number of their different objects together uh, focused under one name identifier. Um, what I show you on the other side of the screen is the registration uh, <coughs> process for an ORCID identifier. Registration is free. Um, it costs absolutely <coughs> nothing and requires no membership. Um, what you see here is that you have to enter your first name, your last name, your email address, create a password, decide um, what privacy default you want for your new research works, 
Um, and then there's a few notification questions that are asked and then sign off on agreeing to the, consenting to the privacy policy in terms of conditions. Um, so anybody that's listening, if you have a computer handy and a second screen, <laughs> I encourage you to go ahead and register. It's, um, it's orchid.org, that's O-R-C-I-D dot O-R-G slash register. Um, and tell me later on how long it took you to register. It should be about 30 to 45 seconds. So something to do while you're listening. Um, so what are the benefits of ORCID? Um, and the benefits um, really depend on where you sit in the community. The ones I've put on this slide I think are the most general benefits. First, ORCID provides a unique and persistent identifier that can be used throughout an individual's career. You can obtain it at any time uh, during your career. You can um, input uh, retrospective research works and link them to your ORCID identifier. And you can also use that identifier moving forward um, in a variety of different workflows to ensure that the identifier becomes embedded um, and that information then becomes posted um, to your ORCID record and keeps it up to date. So the second benefit is improved system interoperability, again, across all of these uh, natural silos that exist today. Um, and that interoperability supports reduced reported workloads for researchers. If your ORCID record becomes updated on an automated basis, now that you're embedding the identifier in these, in these documents, um, that means instead of asking a researcher for the update, um, whoever is asking can actually query the ORCID registry for that information. Um, this can assist in automating repository deposition, institutional reporting, and also post-award grant reporting. Lots of things that can be assisted here. Um, the other piece is that, well, as I said, o ORCID is an open organization. The ORCID identifier is an open standard. Um, and these APIs um, are open, they're posted, and can be used in any setting. Um, so we have a public API that can be used free of charge. We have a sandbox for testing both the um, public API and member API. And the member API does require um, that an organization sign off on our membership agreement. Um, and pay a membership fee, um, but we do have um, the ability to test that membership, sorry, the member API um, in the sandbox prior to becoming a member. We want people to use these um, APIs. We want people to develop on top of the ORCID registry and provide additional functionality. So for the benefits to be realized, however, there's three things that need to be satisfied. The first one, um, as a researcher-driven resource, um, ORCID must be seen as a benefit by researchers. They have to understand the benefit of creating ORCID identifiers. Researchers then need to actually take action and create or claim an ORCID account. Um, but a piece of that is that research information processes and systems have to adopt ORCID as a standard person identifier, embed them, and link back with the ORCID registry. All of those three um, pieces have to happen. Um, for the researchers to see the benefit, they have to be embedded, and for them to be embedded, the researchers need to see the need to actually use them. So what I'm going to talk about a bit now is where we are um, in terms of adoption in the community. I'll talk a bit about use um, uh, and where we are internationally, um, as well as who has actually embedded these identifiers in what kinds of systems. Um, so this first slide, um, usage is clearly international. Um, this is our Google Analytics slide. Um, we have um, over 120,000 people that have registered for ORCID identifiers since our launch in October. Um, these numbers represent um, 11 countries that have, actually it's more than 11 now, over 10,000 visitors to the site, <coughs> almost 50 countries with more than 1,000 visitors, and um, over 80 countries that have over 100 visitors. So while the U.S. has about 17.5% of the total visits, that's really, you know, way less. Um, it's not half, right? It's a proportion. U.K., China, Spain, Italy, Brazil, Germany, India, Australia, and Japan, these are the top 10, all have over 10,000 users on the site, unique users on the site. Um, and this goes pretty quickly into 1%, a long, long trailing tail. A lot of countries are already using ORCID identifiers. There's very little white on the chart you see there. Um, the other piece I wanted to point out on this slide is um, steady growth um, since our launch in October. Um, what I did want you to mention, and this is where 
I don't know if you can see my, my mouse here. Um, right about here, there's actually an inflection point in the, in the growth. We went from about four to 5,000 new users a week uh, to about six to 7,000 a week. Um, and so we're hoping to get another <laughs> inflection point um, pretty soon here um, so we can uh, continue to see growing adoption in the, in the researcher um, population. So I'm just thrilled by this. Um, all right, so that's where we are um, with researcher adoption, people coming to the site and using it. Um, let's talk a bit about who's actually embedding ORC identifiers. So we currently have 41 subscribers and member organizations. Um, you can see there in the fourth bullet we list ANDS with repository and profile systems. Um, we have a number of professional associations. This is the uh, Psychological Association, the Physical Society, uh, Computing Machinery, the MLA, the Modern Language Association, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. So just reading those off, it's very clear that we're interdisciplinary. Um, we have four funders, so the NIH, Wellcome Trust, um, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration um, just signed up, and the Department of Energy in the U.S. is just about to sign off on a member agreement. And we've been in conversations with funders in um, the United Kingdom and Canada, um, and a bit in Australia as well, um, to um, encourage them to embed work identifiers in the grant application process. I should mention that associations, the ones listed there, have all been focusing on their public application process and integrating ORCID identifiers into manuscript submission. Um, there's also publishers and publishing vendors. Um, you can see the giant publishers, in particular the journal publishers, are all members of ORCID. And we have, for example, Nature, Aries, Copernicus, Elsevier, Epistemium, Hindawi have already integrated ORCID identifiers and are collecting them already in the manuscript submission process. And there are actually, um, I believe through Hindawi already, work and identifiers that um, are associated with published manuscripts that um, metadata for which is sitting in Crossref. So you can actually now query Crossref using an ORCID identifier and find some papers, which is very exciting considering that we just launched in October. So I'm just, I, again, I'm thrilled. Um, repository and profile systems, a number of different organizations there. Um, you can see ANDS, Avedis is a, a, a profile a provider for universities. Um, Crossref, you know, um, <clears throat> faculty of a thousand also provides faculty profiles. Figshare, the data set um, repository. Um, IFPRI is a food policy research institute. Node, um, it, it goes on. There's just a really great organizations that are working with Orchid to integrate. Um, and then finally, universities and research organizations are working closely with ORCID to integrate into uh, faculty profile systems at the university, um, into faculty uh, human resource records, um, things like that. Um, so Boston University is close. Um, we have, let's see who else is on here. Harvard has been integrating into their um, uh, faculty record system. And then we have um, New York University is working as well. And Oviedo is actually, through the library, creating records for their researchers. So there's a lot happening also in the university realm. So that's who we are with members. Um, as I mentioned here, some of the different systems that we have um, embedding in university CRIS systems, manuscript submission, grant applications, linkage with repositories. The piece I didn't mention just now is linkage with other identifiers identifiers. So there are, I'm you know, fully acknowledging that there are other um, researcher identifier systems out there. Um, one of the reasons that ORCID was founded was because those companies, those organizations that offer those identifiers realized fully that they didn't work internationally or they didn't work across disciplines. So what ORCID does is that it provides a way to link these identifiers together for one. Um, and so now you can have both the researcher ID a Scopus ID linked to your ORCID identifier, and now all of those identities are linked together. If you have an archive ID or a REPEC ID, you can do the same thing. Same thing with your Australian national ID. Um, we're also talking with membership, uh, so professional associations to explore integration in their membership systems, and also um, in the process when you submit an abstract to a meeting. So these are things that we're talking with folks about. So what about the relationship between integrators and um, uptake? Um, so what we find is about 
thirty percent of the registrations um, on the ORCID website are through these immigration points. This pie chart is actually a little bit old, um, but we see, you know, of that thirty percent, about half of it is through manuscript submission. Uh, another almost half is from uh, linkage with ex external IDs like Scopus and uh, researcher ID. Um, and then we have some linkages through social media sites and other sites. Um, and so what we're doing is tracking this over time to see, um, you know, if that is still remains 60-30, um, and as other immigrations are added, you know, what other proportion of, of immigrations come in. But clearly, the integration points um, are really important for uh, bringing people to ORCID and registering. So this is all good. And I'm really hoping we will have ANDS in here um, and people coming and getting an ORCID identifier to assist with their management of data. And I, I know that uh, um, that Amir is going to talk about. Sorry, yeah, Amir is going to talk about that a bit in the end. So, what is the ORCID registry? Um, so, what I've shown here is you have your identifier here in the big blue blob. Um, that identifier is linked to um, a few things, right? Your account, where as an individual you have account settings and you can manage permissions. And I'll talk a bit about privacy in a minute. Um, you also have an ORCID record component to this. You can actually add information, your biography, and you can add research activities information. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you can link your identifier to a number of other systems, right? You can link it to other identifiers. Right now, Research ID and Scopus are active. Um, you can link your identifier to these research information systems at universities, funders, and governments. And pretty much any research institution, doesn't matter if it's for profit or nonprofit. And finally, you can link it, <coughs> pardon me, within workflows, okay, which we've talked about. What about privacy? So again, ORCID is a researcher. It's a community-driven effort. Um, an individual essentially owns and controls the information in their ORCID record. The only thing that is default public is the identifier itself. Everything else in that record, the individual controls. Um, you can set at the item level, um, items to be public, which is accessible by anyone. You can set them to be what we call limited access, which is accessible by yourself, a proxy that you appoint, or by a trusted organization that you have accepted. Okay, um, And you can also set them as private. So this is accessible only by you or your proxy at every level. So you could decide to have your name and your publication public but your email address private, okay? Um, the other piece of this is that ORCID, again, as an open initiative, creates a data set once a year of all of the public data in the registry, and we will post that data set on the ORCID website for people to use. So anything that's marked as public by the individual will be available in that data set for reuse under a CTO waiver, okay? All right, so what are the personas? We have the scholar or researcher themselves. We have the proxy that can be assigned by the researcher. Trusted organizations, these are ORCID members that have signed a member agreement with very stringent privacy policy regulations. Um, these trusted organizations can view, add, or edit information um, in the ORCID record with the scholar's uh, explicit approval. Um, trusted organizations, if they are an employer of an individual, can also create an ORCID record on behalf of that individual. But the individual needs to claim it. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. Gosh, maybe we won't. Um, so I'm happy to ask, qu answer questions about trusted organizations or creation. Again, the only organizations that can create ORCID records are those organizations that are in an employee-employer relationship with an individual. No one else can do that. All right, and I'm going to show a couple example workflows just to give you a picture of how the system works. Um, so linking to a CRIS system and importing information to the first one, embedding in manuscript submission systems in production, linking to an external identifier, and consuming data to generate usage statistics. There are other out there, but I wanted to make sure I didn't go over time and gave folks time to ask questions. Um, so this is one example. This is a vendor, Avedis, um, who has integrated the ORCID identifier into their offering for universities. 
Um, this just shows an example here on this page. <coughs> pardon me. Of the ORCID identifier displayed on their page. They actually have a GET where you can search for the identifier, and it'll use actually the public API in this example to populate this field. But the individual doesn't type it in. It's, it's sent via uh, com computer, com sorry, computer to computer interactions. Um, this system also allows you to import publications from the ORCID record. So this is a way to help keep your local football system up to date is through that linkage with the record. Um, and it doesn't just have to be publications, it could also be data sets and other research works. Anything that is in that ORCID record can be used to populate this. And over time what they're talking about is making this an automated process so the individual um, can explicitly approve um, their local profile system to do the query and populate the local record. All right. Um, the next one, manuscript submission. Um, this is just a quote from an article, an editorial um, in Nature um, earlier in January um, by Phil Abelson talking about ORCID and the fact that Nature Journals, uh, the authors that submit papers to Nature Journals can link their ORCID identifier to their account um, during manuscript submission and that they are soon going to be publishing authors' ORCID identifiers in the paper. Um, I don't have word about how that's going to be formatted, but this is really great news. Um, it also provides uh, researchers with a very clear incentive to obtain an ORCID identifier. Um, linking to other identifiers, this is an example uh, for researcher ID. There is a similar kind of thing for Scopus as well. Um, so here we have researcher ID. Um, when you're in the researcher ID interface, it asks you if you would like to create an ORCID record or you already have an ORCID record. Um, and then it allows you to exchange information between um, your, your uh, researcher ID profile and um, your ORCID record. So it allows you to say, yeah, I want to exchange uh, my profile data, which would be essentially your biography. Um, you'd allow to send research ID publications to ORCID to essentially pre-populate that record um, and link to those, to those, uh, sorry, link those publications to your ORCID identifier. And you can also go the other way, which is retrieving publications that have been linked to your ORCID identifier and pushing them to your researcher ID account. So all of those things are possible through that interface. Um, and then finally, generating usage statistics. Here is an example from Impact Story. There are some, whoops, sorry, some other examples. Um, here you have um, the ability to enter your ORCID identifier, and then what Impact Story does is it pulls your publications from your ORCID record uh, and generates usage statistics using their algorithms. And so what you can see here, this is an example from me. Um, some of, whoops, sorry, some of my papers. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the statistics that they've generated. So this is, again, another incentive for researchers to have an identifier, a very easy way um, to uh, use this identifier to check on um, usage for your papers and potentially data sets as well. Um, a little bit about where we're going over the course of this year. Um, we just, we're actually in the process of launching what we call an ambassador program. We're looking in particular for people at universities or in specific sectors of the research community to work with us to um, help us understand needs of specific communities and communicate benefits of working in those communities. Um, we are hosting an um, outreach meeting and a code fest in May in Oxford, which is a long way from Australia, but you're welcome to join us. Uh, we're in the process of setting up a webcast. Um, I thought it might be a little late for you guys. Um, we are uh, working on a number of, of um, workflows. Um, so one of them is uh, translating content on the site uh, so that it is um, accessible to folks with multiple languages. Um, and uh, we're also working on a number of standard integration workflows. Um, as you can see here, there's uh, publishers, external IDs, repositories. Um, and then making sure that all aspects of the ORCID um, registry user interface are activated. So adding things like um, uh, affiliations, uh, the ability to enter information on grants and patents, and then being able to cross-link work. So there's a lot of things coming. We'll have another outreach meeting in October, and that's going to be in Washington, D.C. So um, 
that's where we are with the roadmap. Again, every page of the ORCID registry has a little button you can click. If you have an idea, please, please tell us what you'd like us to be doing. Um, you can also vote on already submitted ideas. Um, and if you need more information, here's the information page. Um, you can come to our website. Uh, you can go to our knowledge base to learn more about um, technical aspects of integration and our APIs. Um, ORCID code is posted in an open source repository on GitHub. We have a blog, we have Twitter, <laughs> and there's me. So um, thank you so much for listening. Um, and I guess we can go from here to talk about what ANDS is doing with the ORCID identifier, which I think you'll find very interesting. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Oh, sorry, oh, I think I was muted there. Thanks, uh, Laura. That was a terrific overview of the um, ORCID initiative. I just have a, a little question before we go on to what ANS is doing. Um, around the, the, the governance of, of, of ORCID, seeing as though it will, will hopefully uh, play a fundamental role in information about research, um, you know, that kind of linkage role between you know, information from publications and grant areas and data repositories. Um, what, what, you know, how, how is the governance set up and, and, you know, into the future, how would we um, have confidence that, you know, the, that the great power that, you know, we are all hoping that, you know, ORCID will develop will be used uh, for the good of mankind, like, like right. you know, Google <laughs> doing no evil or something yeah, like right, that. No evil. Yeah. So, so what, you know, what, yeah. what's the relationship with you know the publishers and the the universities and right? So Orchid is um, by um, by design a nonprofit organization. The uh, board we have a board of directors. There's 14 people on our board of directors. They have to be members of Orchid to be on the board. Um, and the board is majority nonprofit by design. Um, our bylaws state that ORCID cannot be sold, that we must maintain ourselves as a nonprofit entity. Um, and we also have, um, uh, I, I guess you could say, we have um, policies in place that if ORCID were to change hands, again, it remains nonprofit, but we have uh, policies in place um, for how we manage um, transfer of data should that happen. But um, I don't see that happening at this point. Um, so we have a, a majority nonprofit board made up of members. We have elections once a year, so the board um, chair transfers um, once a year in January. We switch over to a new board chair and a new board. We have members um, are on the board for three years um, and then rotate off. We also have um, out, uh, steering groups, so we have an outreach steering group. Um, a technical steering group and a business steering group. These are all open to anyone to participate. So you're welcome to go to our website, self-nominate yourself, tell me you're interested. Um, and we also have working groups that any of these steering groups can set up um, um, if they have a particular question. So we're actually just in the process of finishing um, uh, work with a metadata works group that um, is part of the technical steering group. Um, there's going to be a new one launched um, if you notice this previous slide, a new one launched to talk about claim store and how we manage multiple claims in the data. All of these are open to the public. Um, and we also have a very open process for um, development. So we have what are called Trello boards. Anyone can go in and see what we're working on in any given day. Um, you can comment on things. Um, and as I mentioned, you can always submit an idea to our ideas board, vote on ideas. Um, and finally, our code is open source, um, and we're looking forward to people actually contributing code, contributing ideas um, in that venue as well. So we are as open and transparent as I can possibly manage any organization being. Um, if you want more, let us know, and uh, we'll find a way to provide it. Mm. Now, the um, you know the strength of Orchid is the. Is, is the uh, the kind of cooperative nature, I suppose, between the the publishers and the, the universities, etc. So, um, really, it's all right, it's my fault. Um, the I think you've really got the, a, a very nice balance there. You know, to have a, a third party neutral 
kind of you know, non-profit organization um, you know, aggregating the information about people from uh, all these you know, uh, right. I think yeah. One of the things that's interesting about Orchid is it was really formed as a collaboration between organizations that realized that they could not do this on their own and it could not be done in a commercial setting. Yeah, we're just switching over the presentation. Uh, thanks, Adrian, and thanks, Lori, for a very interesting introduction to what Orchid is. Um, well, based on the fact that Orchid provides a great platform for obtaining information about the schol scholarly work and what the researchers is doing, uh, ANS initiated an interoperability project between the ANS services and Orchid platform uh, back in uh, January. And the objective was to improve the identity awareness of data, which uh, that means linking the data sets to researchers, publications, and grants using the metadata that we can harvest from the uh, ORCID repository. Now, in that context, the, the approach that we are taking is providing the solution and support for ANS partners to leverage ORCID platform that includes the policies, the documentations, trainings, and webinars, and you are in one of those webinars. Uh, and in the in a uh, technical point of view, what we are doing, we are uh, enabling the uh, RDA contributors to link their research collections to ORCID identifiers when they provide data to RDA. Also, we are working in the, another phase of this project to provide RDA as a source of information into ORCID. And I will just for our non-Australian listeners, which is again, Laurie, the RDA is the Research Data Australia. It's, uh, um, information portal about uh, data in Australia. Yes, sorry, I take that as a granted <laughs> that everyone knows what the RDA is. Uh, now, the roadmap of our integration is the first phase of the project, which is almost complete, was ORCID integration into FCS. In the second phase, we're working on RDA integration into ORCID. And the third phase, which are mainly focused on further automation, is our extended activity around this interoperability project. So I, I get to each phase individually. So the phase one, which is almost completed, it, uh, at this stage we delivered the ORCID identifier type as an embedded element inside FCS. And we enhanced the uh, Research Data Australia source code to ingest and resolve ORCID identifiers. So what that enables is uh, it provides a functionality for the contributors to provide ORCID identifiers as a related object to our collections. Uh, and that, uh, in that part, the system would identify this identifier as a known identifier. Uh, this functionality would be available as part of the new software release for Research Data Australia, which is on 15th of May. And once this happened, then we would be able to say, OK, well, uh, at least we can have that connectivity between the ORCID records and the data sets in RDA from the Australian organization's perspective. Now, in the second phase of project, we are moving more into the international domain. And the idea here is that in the ORCID account, and I think it's a similar thing as we have seen in the previous slides from uh, when Lori was talking about integration between and nature or uh, scopus into the ORCID. Now, similar to this, in the ORCID interface, at the current stage, there is a link to says import research activities. When you click on this link, it gives you options. That, okay, well, what are the source of information that you want to import? And in this phase, what we aim to do, we aim to basically implement a workflow that uh, it takes the ORCID user to a uh, to a page in RDA, and in that uh, page, the user get the options to see the relevant data sets and collections that are related to the name of the person. And in addition, you will get the options to uh, do an extra search to say, okay, well, this is not all my collections. I have some collections under different names. All of this information, once the user confirms that this is my data sets, then they will be sent back to ORCID. So the ORCID user would be able to see that information. If I go to the previous slide, in a page like this, when you look at the works uh, collection in ORCID, you would be able to see my data sets in that list. 
In addition, what we are going to do, we are going to actually store that information in the RBA. So when you are browsing through different collections in the Research Data Australia, you will be able to see that all these collections are linked to this ORCID account. And one of the other things that would be the byproduct of this functionality is that you will be able to see the collections that are uh, intrinsically connected because both of them are linked to the same ORCID identifier. Now, this phase is the next stage of the integration and ANS development team would start working on this after the release of R10, which is, if I'm not mistaken, 15 of May. Uh, so we are hoping to uh, achieve a, this functionality in the live environment in late July or in August. The third phase of our integration with ORCID is mainly enhancing the existing functionalities. They're reducing the manual matching by researchers is one of the goals. Uh, the other thing that we are very much looking forward to it is using the ORCID identifiers to link the collections to other activities such as projects and grants. And also, uh, we, are, we had a, this discussion with Lori that there is opportunity here to link the ORCID identifiers and NLA identifiers through the RDA platform. And the, also the other option here is that linking the publication to data sets. Now, all of these options here at this stage for the phase three is very much at the planning stage. So we haven't actually prioritized different items in this list. We welcome your ideas. We welcome uh, suggestions of what are the other things that you want to see in this platform. And this is the phase that is almost going to be shaped by the input of the community. Now, this is overall, uh, if you like, roadmap of RDA and uh, ORCID integration. And I think I'm going to actually stop here and don't discuss any further because we have only about uh, 12 minutes to the end of this webinar. Give you time to you guys to ask questions and we have a kind of like a, a dialogue rather than a monologue here. Okay, so I'm handing over this to Adrian. All right, thank you, Amir. That's excellent. And uh, really some exciting uh, directions there. Um, just to say um, the Anne's experience of uh, working with uh, ORCID has been absolutely marvellous. The interfaces are all well um, documented and very easy to work with. So if any of the organisation, any other if anyone on the um, webinar is thinking of um, you know, using those interfaces at their organizational level, I can say that our experience has been totally painless um, and uh, you know, really nice, you know, good support from the ORCA team as well. Um, Laurie, I was going to ask, the kinds of people that we have on the call today are around uh, working with <coughs> Uh, at universities, what, what kind of um, scenarios have you seen with uh, universities considering, um, you know, perhaps a, a bulk um, approach to creating identifiers for their um, for their employees? Have, have right. You, uh, so, yeah. So we have a couple different, well, several different approaches actually. Each university has its own culture. Um, and different ways of managing these kinds of initiatives for their faculty. So um, one example is Harvard University, um, which is a member of ORCID um, and actually has been a board member of ORCID since the inception. Um, and they opted for a very lightweight integration of ORCID where they integrated um, the ORCID identifier into their uh, PeopleSoft system. Um, and so when people go update their um, faculty record, they can then create an ORCID identifier and link it with their faculty record at that level. Um, so it's it's a very, very lightweight. It requires very little push from the university. And quite frankly, the university is not creating records on behalf of the researchers, but they're providing incentive because um, adding the ORCID identifier to that faculty record um, allows them to do things like update their local profile system with publication data from the ORCID record to update repository um, repository the same way. Um, and so it's a it's very light, high impact. Um, we have other organizations like um, Boston University that have gone through um, 
um, a pretty extensive process internally, uh, bringing stakeholders together from across the university to uh, work out legal aspects of creating records for individuals, um, as well as a timeline for uh, pushing this out. So they have uh, worked with legal to figure out um, you know, is it opt out, opt in? They have a whole process for communicating with the faculty about creating ORCID records for them, opting out if they want to. Same thing for postdocs, which at Boston are considered students. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, opt in process for the students. Um, and, and that process is wending its way along, but it's a little slow because they have to go through these periods where we would review. Um, and what they will be doing is linking the ORCID identifier to their local profile system, their Boston profile system. So it's going to look pretty similar to what Avedis did, which is here's the profile system. Please create or link to your ORCID record. Um, and hey, you can now uh, do bi-directional data exchange between these two systems. Um, and then we have organizations like uh, Universidad de Oviedo, Oviedo sorry, in Spain, um, that is uh, spearheading uh, from the library the creation of ORCID record practically manually using the, um, using the ORCID API. So um, there's a huge range <laughs> of what organizations are doing. And uh, you know, what we're trying to do is, is clearly um, articulate and summarize what these organizations are doing and uh, provide this experience and information out to the community so that folks can determine which way they want to move. Um, Laura, we have a question from Stephen Emanuel, is that right? Yes, from Stephen, I'm not sure whether we've got your, your, his microphone up. Sometimes the system takes a little moment to uh, warm up. Uh, can you Stephen, hear me, Andrew? Ah, yes, I can. That's good. Okay, yes, just Stephen's I'm unmuted. Okay, my name's Martin. I actually posed this question on behalf of UniSA. Um, Stephen's name is the one that comes up on the menu. But basically, okay. uh, what, what concerns me is that for any system like this to be truly unique, uh, truly successful, it needs to be unique. And at the moment, we've got a number of different identification systems, yours being one, researcher ID being another, for example. And I feel that we're actually introducing problems because, in essence, we're creating multiple names for people by having multiple IDs. And I really believe that what we need to do is get consensus, at least from the universities, possibly globally, that we will utilise a particular identifier, whether or not development has started on that system, and then only when we have consensus, everyone needs to build towards that single system. And I know that's a difficult problem, but I really think that's where the focus ought to be. Right. Um, no, I hear you. And so um, it's really hard to get everyone to agree at the same time on adoption. And so, you know, looking at ORCID, there was a lot of time spent developing a consensus in the community that ORCID was the way to proceed. Um, so ORCID kind of came together in about 2009, um, didn't really hire, I came on board last year. So three years they spent, the board spent um, really working with the community to figure out is ORCID needed, um, how should it be formed, all of these other different questions. And at the end of that, determined that you know over 400 organizations had signed on as either sponsors or participants, all saying yes, let's do ORCID. So the you know the board at that point felt that there was enough of a consensus in the community to move forward with ORCID as um, the name the common name identifier in the research space. But at the same time, um, ORCID was very careful to say, look, you know, there are other name, you know, common name standards out there um, that uh, for whatever reason did not work on a global scale. There is no reason that those identifiers need to go away, but the important thing is to link those different identifiers together using the ORCID identifier um, so that they're all pointing to the same person. Um, and then that individual can choose to use whichever identifier they want to, but quite frankly, the only one that I'm aware of that's being embedded in systems is the ORCID identifier. And so I think that over time you'll start to see people using that ORCID identifier um, during their research career. Um, and people, they're already using it. 
So I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I feel that the um, folks who started the Orchid Initiative have done a lot of work developing that consensus, and now it's time for those organizations that may not have heard of that to really consider um, and take part in the initiative as it moves forward. We have another question from uh, Susan Robbins. Um, just wondering, Susan, can you hear us? Or more importantly, can we hear you is the question? Is it warming up? Just thinking. Susan? No? Let me just read through one of um, Susan's questions whilst we're trying to get her audio there. Susan, if you're listening, we're try and say something and we'll um, put you on. There was one of the questions you had was about um, the integration with uh, places such as uh, Scopus. What if the Scopus record is incorrect? Will that uh, corrupt the ORCID data? No, so this is interesting actually. So as you know, Scopus was doing um, automated disambiguation of their publishing, uh, sorry, the publication database and then assigning a Scopus ID to their clusters that they identify this method. And so um, what they do through the integration with ORCID is allow research to come in and actually clean up their Scopus records. Um, so if something is there that shouldn't be there, an individual can tell them that. And if there's something that needs to be there that isn't, an individual can also communicate that with um, the Scopus team through this integration. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we saw when um, the integration went live, which actually went live the same time ORCID went live in October, um, was you know two countries, um, Italy and Spain, that were coming up for a national evaluation. Um, there's a huge number of researchers that came to Scopus or ORCID um, and did this linking and cleaned up their ORCID record. Sorry, their sorry, their Scopus record and imported those works into ORCID to make sure that their ORCID identifier and the proper list of um, Scopus articles were, uh, were linked together. Um, so there's a huge opportunity here for other databases that were similarly constructed using these automated algorithms to get input from the researchers to validate the content um, of those. And I should mention, when I did this work, um, the, the um, linkage with Scopus, they had identified two different uh, groupings that were both mine. And I was able to say, these are both me. And then what Scopus did was merge those records together um, and uh, under one Scopus ID and now link to my ORCID identifier. So like I said, this is a great opportunity to validate those automated, um, automated clusters. Another question that Susan has is um, whether these things would be updated automatically, meaning um, if Scopus gets some new information uh, about me and I've previously linked to Scopus from ORCID, would, would the new information be updated? <laughs> so um, the answer is yes and no. Um, you have to explicitly approve that update. Um, but because you have approved Scopus as a what we call a trusted party uh, through that linkage process, what then can happen is Scopus can now send you a note, essentially saying, uh, we have found a new article for you. Would you like to update your ORCID record with it? Um, what we're thinking about and we'd really like community input on is whether um, researchers would like to just approve those updates in bulk for some period of time, or if there is a preferred um, ability to approve anything before it is um, linked back to an ORCID record. So it's semi-automated. So again, looking for community input on the problem set. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, I just have to reiterate that you know uh, the opportunity that Anne sees you know in Orchid is absolutely marvelous. In that it's the the right. To, it's a community approach. It's a trusted provider. Um, we have uh, it's the, the the right kind of community of practice as well. The, you know the same kind of people who create data sets uh, are generally linked with the major members of Orchid. You know the, the publishers, the, the grant uh, uh, the, the grant funders, and the universities. So if you can build a strong community of practice around researcher identification with those you know big players in research, you know the 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 research institutions, the, the funders and the publishers, then we really see that there's you know terrific um, potential here. And um, you know whether 
uh, it covers everything in the world. We, you know, actually we're not fast as long as it, it covers the, the, you know, the particular area of research that, that, that we are looking for because, you know, I'm sure there are ident other identities that are used for, you know, other things. Um, but this one is looking really, really promising for that linkage between researchers and their output. Um, now, so if we wanted to, uh, people wanted to get in contact with you, those last, on your last slide there, we had your email, is that right, yeah. Laurie? Is, that, is, that, what, is there a, what's the best way to, for an organisation that's interested in ORCID to um, get in contact with you? Yeah, the best way is through email, um, which is l.hack at orchid.org. It is on the last slide. Um, and yeah, feel free to get in contact with me, please. And um, is there a, um, did you say you had a Twitter feed or a? Yes, yeah, so we have a Twitter feed. It's at orchid underscore org. Um, it's a really great way to follow us. We do not barrage people with information. Um, I just sent out the first tweet in a little while today about the Orchid ISME um, interoperation notice. Um, usually there's two or three tweets a week. Um, so yeah, there's orchid.org and we also have a blog um, and uh, that's like two or three posts a month um, and you can uh, subscribe to that on um, the Orchid website under orchid.org uh, orchid slash um, news. So um, yeah, all of that's there, very easy to access. Good, and um, we look forward to you know, perhaps uh, getting in touch with you again um, perhaps in a few months. We might look at a, a different aspect of ORCID in perhaps more detail. This is a, a good overview, but um, once we get a, a handle of how the universities in Australia are adopting this, we'd be happy to come back again and um, perhaps go from ORCID 101 to, you know, Orchid for the postgraduate Orchid um, webinar. Exactly, I would love that. That would be great. Terrific, and you know we might look at from a technical point of view, get a bit more information about the uh, integration if that's uh, necessary. Um, Amir, to get more information about what Anz is doing on um, the uh, Orchid Anz integration project, what what would what would be best there? Yes, we have uh, two web pages on the ANS website. One is the there is ORCID page, and there is a ORCID uh, and there is a page that's called Identifying Researchers. So, as we are moving forward in this project, we will post the information on those pages. Also, there will be more information available on the ANS newsletter and ANS uh, uh, ANS on uh, monthly uh, publications that we have. From the technical point of view, uh, after the visit of R10, there will be some follow-up webinars and some follow-up uh, follow training materials. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me or other colleagues in ANS. Okay, very good. Uh, just um, to talk about a little bit what's coming up on the other webinar series that we have. Um, in May, there's uh, some very interesting uh, webinars around uh, data citation, DOIs and data citation, as well as uh, minting stories about uh, DOI. Um, and there is uh, also some information about the new software release um, later in May as well. So I uh, urge you all to have a look at the uh, ANS website. Um, so that's ans.org.au slash events and uh, keep in touch with the uh, exciting new webinars that are coming online there. Thank you very much, uh, Laurie. We'll let you uh, get back to your after dinner court or whatever it is that you do in uh, in Washington. And uh, thanks so much for um, uh, giving us that great overview of Orchid. And thank you so much for having me. All right, and all right. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Amir. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Laurie. All right. Bye for now. Bye bye.